Father, we want to thank thee this evening for thy word. We do ask that we be exalted tonight in its preaching. We do ask for thy Holy Spirit to encourage us, to edify us, and to teach us what thou have us to learn this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. The title of this evening message is Magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1. I'll read verses 19 to 26. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation, and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having the desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your infirmities and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi from prison. Paul wrote three books, from his, during, four books during his first Roman imprisonment. Pre, Roman imprisonment. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes people. In the book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse 16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Paul was a persecutor of the church, a persecutor of Christ, and then God converted him. God changed him and became a preacher for Christ. And he was falsely imprisoned. He was imprisoned for the gospel's sake. And Paul knew he knew that the gospel that reached the church at Philippi, those saints, in Philippians 1, 6, early on, earlier in this chapter, he said, he tells them, he reminds them, being confident of this very thing that he who hath begun a good work will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He wants to encourage the saints there at Philippi of the fact that that they can be confident, being confident, something that happened in the past with a continual result down in the future. The confidence can go on. He that began a good work, a one-time work of salvation. Salvation doesn't have to occur again and again and again. It happened one time in the believer's life. It happened one time in your life, one time in my life, and it will continue on. He promises to perform it. Futuristic. He promises to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul was falsely imprisoned. He was falsely imprisoned for the gospel. But because of this, the gospel had furtherance. The gospel had furtherance. In other words, 
the objective they had was to stop him from preaching the gospel. But it did just the opposite. In verse 12 of this chapter, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel. See, persecution of the church brings spiritual growth. In communist countries around the world, Christians are growing. The gospel is not killed. If socialism or communism comes to a capital 150 miles away from where we're standing today, the gospel will not be stopped. Christianity will not die. And by putting Paul in prison, did not stop the gospel. He was able to write these the four prison epistles, the first Roman epistles, from the first Roman imprisonment, for the, from the first Roman imprisonment from prison. The furtherance of the gospel. The gospel is the good news of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done upon the cross of Calvary. Looking at verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. The idea of Paul knowing this. Something he could perceive, he could visualize with his eyes. He knew about his deliverance. He knew that the time he would be in prison was temporary. He had a desire to come and to see and to visit with the saints there at Philippi. In the book of Romans, Paul tells the church, the saints there at Rome, in Romans, Romans 8 and verse 28, he tells them, And we know that all things work together for good, to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Paul could understand the fact that this time he was spending in prison, this time he was away from people he loved, away from people he wanted to minister, to whom he wanted to minister, it was a time that it was working together for good. In the book of 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter tells us that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.7 more valuable than gold, the trial of your faith. You know, even though gold is valuable, whatever it is, $1,000, $1,200, $1,500 a troy ounce, it doesn't compare to the value of the trial of one's faith, the, the ability that one could have in having the spiritual growth that's derived from the persecution, whatever the trial it might be. It may, be, may, may not be direct persecution, but there's other types of trials and other types of heartaches, other types of burdens that each of us, each of us bear. And Paul was saying, he was trying to encourage the saints here in Philippi. He was telling them how he would be delivered. I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. Never underestimate the power and the purpose of prayer. In, in the previous book, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, Paul told the church at Ephesus, in another prison epistle, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul wanted always to look for an opportunity where he could preach the gospel. But then notice verse 18 began with praying always. There is an importance of prayer. Everyone can pray. No matter what your condition might be, you can still pray. You may not be able to do other tasks of spreading the gospel, but you know of people, perhaps, for whom you could pray. They may be fellow saints, fellow Christians, 
or there may be people that are lost, people that are still dead in their trespass and sin. Those are the people you could pray for. Those are the people you could ask the opportunity for someone, for the gospel, for the Holy Spirit to convict them of their need of salvation so that the mystery of the gospel can open their eyes and turn them from darkness to life. And in verse 19, at the end of the verse, he says, And the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The supply of the Spirit of Christ. In Romans, Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, Romans 8 9, the Bible reminds us, again, another epistle that the Holy Spirit used Paul to pen, Romans 8 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The importance of the Spirit of Christ, the permanent indwelling of the Spirit of Christ is within all of us. And that's why we can pray. As we mentioned this morning, with groanings which cannot be uttered, we can pray. We might not know how to pray, what to pray, but we can pray. We have to pray from our heart, with a pure heart, like, like Hannah prayed. We must pray and continue to pray. In 1 Peter, we also have the Spirit of Christ being mentioned. 1 Peter 1.11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And so Paul was encouraging the saints there in Philippi to pray, to understand the purpose for why he was in prison, the purpose of how God could still be glorified. The Lord Jesus Christ could be honored in everything, how he should be honored in everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think. That when we fail, we shouldn't proceed on the wrong path. We should get back in the path that God wants us on. We should confess our sin. As Roman John, 1 John 1 9 tells us he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God wants us to be in fellowship with him. He either, as we'll see later on in this next verse or so, we either to live for Christ or we're to die for Christ. We shouldn't be living for ourselves. We shouldn't be dying for ourselves. In verse, in verse 20, Philippians 1.20, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always so now, also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. It was, it was Paul's earnest expectation. His earnest expectation and my hope, he says. The book of Psalms, the psalmist says in Psalm 62, verse 5, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. Our expectations must come from God. They shouldn't come from anything else. They shouldn't come from what society says. They shouldn't come from any other source but of God. Paul's expectations was, were coming from God. They were coming from God. As far as the hope, he says here in verse 20, my current expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. In Psalm 119, verse 116, the Bible says, Uphold me according to thy word that I may, find, that I may live and let me not be ashamed of my hope. As far as in nothing shall I be ashamed. The idea of something that's taking place in the future. Paul's anticipating in the future he will not be ashamed. In the present, in the past, we should not be ashamed. But here in this, in this verse, in verse 20, Paul is saying that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Something that is yet in the future. We want to make sure that what we do today, we will not be ashamed of tomorrow. We want to do everything today so that Christ can be exalted and glorified tomorrow, in the days to come, weeks to come. 
in nothing I shall be ashamed. And this again, the context, Paul is writing from a prison, a Roman prison, which is nothing like the worst prisons in the United States. The prisons of Rome were a lot worse, to put it mildly, than the prisons we have here in this country. But yet Paul says he wants the gospel to be furthered. He says he wants opportunity when he's in prison that the gospel of Christ could be furthered. But he doesn't want to be ashamed, do anything that he's ashamed of. If we were put into prison tonight, how would we respond? Occasionally, maybe once a day or so on the average, the office I, I work at the Bible today receives letters from prisoners. And these prisoners, some of them, are requesting a copy of God's Word. And these men have the opportunity of reading the Bible, studying the Bible in prison. But the prisons they're in is nothing like the prison Paul was in. And these fellows, these men, are in prison because they've done something that violates the law of the land. Paul was falsely imprisoned, but he did not have the wrong attitude. He was not bitter. He was not frustrated. He said, in nothing in the future I want to be ashamed, but that with all boldness... He's saying he wants boldness as now also Christ shall be magnified. In Romans chapter 9, in verse 33, Scripture says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There's nothing to be ashamed of in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many people who are rejecting and resisting the Holy Spirit and do not want to turn to Christ for salvation. They want to do everything they can to resist what God has done for them. They're in darkness. Ephesians 2, 1, they're dead in their trespasses and sin. But Paul says with all boldness, as always, shall Christ be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. The boldness. He wants the freedom to speak. He wants the freedom to speak unrestrained the gospel of Christ. Free to speak without fear. Without the fear. As in, later on, in, earlier on in this chapter, Philippians chapter 1, verse 14, and many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident in my bonds as much more bold to speak the word without fear. See, the boldness Paul wanted, he also wanted the church of Philippi to have. He, God wants us to have that same boldness to speak the word without fear. When we're in a situation this week, this month, God will bring certain people across our path. And perhaps an opportunity will arise where we can share the gospel with those people, whether in part or in whole. But the desire God will have for us is to have the boldness that's necessary. According, and so he wants the boldness to come, as always, so now, now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Paul wanted Christ to be magnified in his body. The idea of magnified, as the idea of being great. The idea of mega is, is, is from the, we've heard the word mega before in, in, our, in our vocabulary from time to time here in this country. The idea of, of being great. And if we a couple that, if Ephesians 2.10, we could have a whole other sermon about workmanships, for he is our workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works. But we'll save that for another time. Ephesians 2.10. But Ephesians 2.8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the idea of being, that Christ should be magnified, being made great. The idea of having a high rank, being splendid being exalted. 
being a very God is a very great thing, and Paul wanted God to be magnified, the Lord Jesus Christ to be magnified in him. And and it should be the same for us in our life. Nothing else should be greater or of greater import than the relationship we have with the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot have a misplaced priority of, of what is more important. All sorts of things are going on in the world today that are competing with Christ being magnified in our body and our life and all that we do and all of our members whether they're members that are exterior to our bodies or the members that are interior to our bodies Christ needs to be magnified in our body and this is the Apostle Paul sitting there in a Roman jail Roman prison that is, in, that is encouraging saints at Philippi to live for Christ to live for Christ if Paul could do this in a jail shouldn't we be able to do this out of a jail to be encouraging to be exhorting to be edifying our brothers and our sisters in the Lord the idea of, of magnifying in, in, second, in second Samuel chapter 7 verse 26 and let the name and rather let thy name be magnified forever saying the Lord of hosts is the God of Israel and let the house of thy servant David be established before thee being magnified the God of Israel to be magnified in Psalm 34 verse 3 O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together the importance of magnifying the name of Christ we don't want to minimize his name or make his name less than what it is we want to magnify him far beyond his name his whole personhood needs to be magnified in Malachi 1 5 and your eyes shall see and ye shall say the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel and when Mary in, in Matthew rather in Luke chapter 1 verse 46 she responded to the Annunciation and Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. And then verse 21, a very, very familiar verse in Philippians, Philippians 121. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ. The idea of our present living right now. We are living right now, and Paul says, for me to live right now is, is Christ. Pause for a moment and think about this. Are we saying that? Is our living right now for Christ? We have to make that our objective if it's not. It has to be our daily objective to live for Christ. For me to live is Christ. We, 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 are, we, we either live or we don't live we, we die that's the two conditions we, we will be in the saints the present saints that are living the present saints that have, have gone before us they have died for me to live is Christ and to die is gain in Philippians chapter 2 later on in this book Philippians chapter 2 verse 21 the Bible reminds us for all seek their own not the things which are of Jesus Christ in the book of Galatians Galatians 6 14 God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world we must live for Christ he is our life because of the resurrection because of the empty tomb we can live we can have newness 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 of life we do not have to anymore be the children of darkness now yes there is a time from time to time 
Romans 6 and other verse, other passages of Scripture tell us that we will disobey, we will transgress the commandments of God. But we don't want to stay in that state. We don't want to stay in that condition. We must confess our sins. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Our physical death happens at one time, one point action. We cannot, we only die one time as far as physically. We're either born twice or we die twice. But one's a, one's, a, one's a spiritual birth and one's a physical birth, or one's a spiritual death and one's a physical death. When we're born, we're born physically. And after we're born physically, we either have to decide whether we die, spirit, die, die spiritually or we're born a second time, born again. Dying twice or being born twice. But for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. We must be looking and anticipating the coming of the Lord. We must occupy. We must be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. We're not necessarily looking for death in our life, but when we do die, when death comes, we all have an appointment with death. We all know brothers and sisters in the Lord who have died. But to die is gain. To die is gain. For that person that went home to be with the Lord. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Those of us who have survived, those of us who are still living, we must live for Christ. For me to live is Christ. And that's what we ought to be doing right now, is living for Christ. In Romans chapter 8, verses 35 and 39, Paul again writes, Romans 8, 35 and 39, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sakes we are all killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, and neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor any other, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. To die, to die is gain. In verse 22, he says, For if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I choose, I wot not. Living in the flesh. That's in the, in the body we have. Living in the flesh. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. In 1 Peter 4.2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. See, we must be living to the will of God. For me to live is Christ, living to God's will, living in that direction. That's where we should be headed, living for Christ, living for Jesus. And the idea of, of the fruit of the labor, his fruit, something that's to take place later, the fruit of the labor, which we, we, we don't know the fruit of our labor all the time, is a keep sign coming. You know, the gospel, the furthest of the gospel, when Paul 
had his Macedonian vision. So they, they said, come on over to Macedonia and help us. That switched the, 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 the direction of the gospel from Asia to Europe. And it went across Europe and across the ocean. The gospel was brought here to this country, to our ancestors, who brought the gospel to America. America's beginning, starting to have their eyes dimmed for the gospel. The fruit of my labor, yet what I choose, I want not. To be, to be able to choose. He, he can't choose. We can't choose what we, what our life is. We don't know. We don't know what a day is going to bring forth. God knows. God's in complete control. And so, in the early verses, he said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And now in verse 22, he says, I'm in a straight. I'm in a, in a narrow place. A place, you know, where... It's, it's difficult. You know, you've got these two things that are going together here. He's in a, he's in a, he's in a strait betwixt two. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which to die is gain. If we are believers, to be with Christ is far better. But the strait is in. He has this desire to depart to be with Christ which is far better. And then in verse 24, nevertheless to remain in the flesh is needful for you. More needful for you. The idea of having this, this, this constraint he's, he's facing. Granted, he, he, was in, he was in this Roman prison. And he thought it would be much better to depart and be with Christ. Which indeed the scripture says to die is game. But also in the next verse it says to remain in the flesh is more needful. So even though Paul wasn't in the best environment, the best circumstances in his life, he understood the fact it was more needful to remain in the flesh so that for me to live is Christ. We tonight that are remaining in the flesh, we tonight that are still living, we must understand for me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. The day of our death, yes, it's, it's scheduled, or the, the day of the rapture, it's scheduled. God knows. We may not know. We don't know. But God wants us to live for Him, for me to live is Christ. He had a desire to depart. A desire to depart to be with Christ. You know, that the idea of this, this desire, you know, a one-time longing that he wanted to be with Christ. We know the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 or same thing, when we do depart, at the time of our death, this, the scripture says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when we do die, if we're believers, absent from the body, present with the Lord. At the moment of our death, our bodies stop working. Our spirit and soul will be with Christ. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And the gain we have, we can be reflected here in 1st and 2nd Corinthians chapter 5. To be with Christ In Luke chapter 23, in verse 43, the day of the crucifixion, the Lord Jesus Christ was on a cross between two thieves. One repentant thief and one reprobate thief. In Luke chapter 23, verse 43, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The Lord Jesus Christ 
died first. He gave up his life. He gave up the ghost. He committed his soul into the hand of the Father. And then after that, the thieves died. One of them went to be with Christ. And one of them went into the eternal lake of fire where he is tonight with that rich man in Luke 16 and all the other reprobates of history that have rejected what God has done for them. The lost man, the lost woman, cannot say for me to live as Christ and die as gain. Because at the day of their death, they'll be eternally separated in the lake of fire from any opportunity to trust Christ. Death, a one-time event. We don't die and come back to life and die again and come back to life. Once man dies, once women die, whether they're old or young, whether they're one day old or perhaps younger than one day old, or 120 years old. There's no opportunity to live again as in a human life. We have eternal life or we have eternal death. But Paul was a believer. He understood to, to, to depart was far better. Certainly, the splendors of glory are far better than the nicest, most beautiful place on the earth, wherever that might be. But he says, nevertheless, in verse 24, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. To be abiding in the flesh, presently. We are all presently abiding in the flesh. Is there a group of people, is there an individual, are there people in our life that we can be needful for spiritually? Yes, we, 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 our role may not be the same as the Apostle Paul, our gifts may not be the same as the Apostle Paul, our gifts. But there are other gifts we have, that you might have. Abiding in the flesh, more needful for you. Whatever your gift might be, your spiritual gift. Exercise that so that others can benefit from that. Other people in the, in the body need the spiritual gift that you have. The body needs to function together. If my, if my body doesn't work together, if my fingers, my hands, all the different things about my physical body doesn't work together, then there's a problem with the, its function. The body of Christ, those that are born-again believers, we have to work with our spiritual gifts together so that each thing can have its proper function. Each role, each one of us can function. There may be feet, there may be eyes, there may be ears. Go through the whole different physical illustration we have. Then we go inside, you know, the heart, the brains, all these different things we have that make our physical body function. Look at all the spiritual gifts we have. Each one of us has been given a gift or gifts at the moment of salvation. And Paul says, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. You see, we have to understand the importance of one another, of how needful it is for you to remain in the flesh for me. How important it is for you to remain in the flesh for them, and so forth. We can look around the room, those that are present and those who are absent, that we know that are in the body of Christ. The need each of us have. Paul was writing to the church of Philippi. It's needful for me to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. In verse 25, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide. And he remains. He's going to stay in the flesh. He's not going to leave yet. Eventually he did die. 
but not yet. I know that I also abide and continue with you for the furtherance and joy of the faith. Back earlier on in, in the chapter, in verse, uh, verse 12, we had the furtherance of the gospel. Now in, in verse 25, we have the furtherance of joy and of faith. Having this confidence, Paul has the confidence. A confidence that began in the past, but yet a confidence that continues on, yet in the future. It just wasn't a one-time confidence, a pantillary confidence. It was a confidence that he had that he should abide. The idea of confidence, a persuasion, he had the faith in the particular thing that he would abide to be able to come, and at least for a time, to be able to minister to the saints at Philippi. The idea of knowing, again, the eyes, the idea we've, we've talked about knowing before earlier on in this, in this, this passage, but to be able to see with his mind, to know and be attentive to a specific thing. And so the idea of abiding, to wait around, to stay, to, stay, to tarry, to sojourn here in his body, because he said earlier, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. When he dies, he's no longer in his body. He's going to remain in his body for a time so that he can minister to the saints at Philippi. We, we are remaining in our bodies for a time so that we can minister to the saints that are in the greater Collinswood area. Or perhaps if we move someplace else in that particular area. That's why we're remaining in the body. So we can do a particular service that God has for us to do. So our, so our gifts can be exercised so that the needs of the saints can be met and can be furthered. The joy of faith. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you. I mean, we, we know Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. The rejoicing may be more abundant. And the source of the rejoicing is not something of, in constant, something of not substantial, it's something of substance. Rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. May be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Think of the idea of, of the joy. I understand Brother Johnson has taken a mission trip to a mission field. Eleven or so people he's taken to the mission field. The, the saints overseas are going to be rejoicing when he comes along with his other Christians. We had some young people just return recently from a mission trip. And the people there in that country, the Christians there in that country rejoiced when those individuals went to help in the ministry there in that field. We don't necessarily have to go across the time zone, across the ocean, to be an encouragement. But the basis of the rejoicing must be in Jesus Christ. Whether we're going across town, whether we travel five or ten miles, perhaps just to visit a saint that may be in a nursing home, or may be shut in, or may not be able to get out as often as they would like, still, just think of what joy you could bring to them when you visit, when you share something of spiritual substance, the Apostle Paul, he intended, and he did, to come to Philippi. He realized the fact to, for him, he says, for me to live is Christ, die is gain. 
but to abide in the flesh is more needful. And all of us tonight, we have a specific need that we can meet in somebody. You know, the, the temporal restraints we face, the temporal problems we, we, we face, you know, there's always an eternal purpose for something. We may understand why certain circumstances cross our path, why certain things happen in our life, but in our bigger picture, the eternal purpose, we should not be ashamed in nothing but want Christ to be magnified in your body, whether it be by life or by death. And so we should say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Each moment we live, each hour we live, each second we live, it should be for Christ. Not for ourselves, not for somebody or something else, but for Christ. We, none of us know the day of our death, but presently we are living. And we must live to glorify and to honor the Lord Jesus Christ because it's needful. It's needful for the other believers, other saints that we know. Father, thank you for thy word. We do ask that it would allow us to understand thy word, allow us to be able to encourage other saints, just as Paul was an encouragement to those saints in Philippi, allow us to be able to function together as a body of believers, that thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your hymnals and turn to him 597. Him 597, take my life and let it be. Let's stand as we sing, please.
Father, we want to thank Thee that Thou art able to keep us from falling. We do ask that would allow us to give us the life that Thou hast given us for service. We know that You are the only one that can present us faultless. It's the power of Thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that will keep and will preserve us. And we do ask that we give us direction. Give us the understanding of what Thou would have us do so we can live for Christ. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.